There's a chatter in the room that they're excited to be together. That's a good thing, right? Let's pray. God, here we are as the sun comes up, ready to hear from you today. We're reminded of the passage that says, This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God, that is what this room is full of. Anticipation. Excitement. What do you have for us now? And then, God, how can our life be lived as an offering for you for the remainder of the day for your glory, God? Help us honor you. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Okay, as we start off today, we're going to start with our group split off. And as we do, you'll have a chance to turn to your accountability sheet. So go ahead and turn to page 147 and pass that to your small group leader. I recognize there's a few small group leaders that aren't able to be here today. And so if that's the case, I'll come by here in just a moment or Brandon will. Um, One of the other things that you'll need to do today after the sign-off is turn to page 7. Go through the um, three-ping the passage. Okay, so you'll want to three-p that passage that we normally do there. Then you'll want to turn to the assignment review questions on page 146. And look specifically at question 3. It keeps us... Uh, on the hot seat, right? It uh, holds our feet to the fire there. And then somebody will want to do the do a 3P, a DBR, right? 3P, one of our daily Bible reading notes. Finally, each person will need to quote 2 Corinthians 12.9 uh, to a partner, and you'll have one person 3P it there from your group. Okay. After that, we'll come back together for our teaching time. But I'm going to give you, this morning, I'm going to give you 12 minutes. That's more than usual because I have a feeling you all are going to need it. That's a lot of stuff we need to cover. So let's get after it. I heard a little complaint that 12 minutes was just not enough. Ironically, that complaint came from somebody who complains about how long my sermons are almost every week. So... It's just one of those times. <laughs> hey, as we're getting started, let me encourage you all to turn to page 150 and let's get it started quick before Russ gets back at me. <clears throat> page 150. There is a fantastic thought that is right there at the very beginning of this session. It's labeled point B as a continuation from the previous week. But here's what it says. Commit yourself to a lifetime project of mastering the Bible. And you will find that it is mastering you. In transforming your life by renewing your mind and heart. I really love this concept. There's a whole lot to it. Oftentimes we think, okay, I'm going to do everything I can to to dive in. I'm going to pour my discipline into knowing this. But what we find as we interact with the Word of God is that it's not us getting better about it. It's really it soaking into who we are. Therefore, changing us at our core. Making us see things new giving us a new perspective, giving us a different angle, changes us. One of the things uh, that I remember and that I think about, there's a gentleman that I know in this world who knows the Bible maybe better than anybody I know, but he's never let it change him. He's real smart, real arrogant. He uses it as a weapon to beat other people. But it's never changed him. I actually saw this gentleman this last week, and it was weird how my insides like, "Mm, oh, I don't want to be like that. And the reality is I don't want you all to be like that. I don't want it to be a thing where you use the Bible for intelligence or you use it to have a better IQ over somebody or you use it to say I'm smarter than or I'm better than it's it's none of those things what we do is we say I want to know the Word of God so that it changes me 
And so what this says, commit yourself to a lifetime project of mastering the Bible. It's arrogant really to think that we can truly master the Bible. However, I will tell you there are a few passages that I try to think through. And it's really my hope that I perhaps could master those. You know where Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. Just like I've loved you, you must love one another. I, I want to I live that out in the way that I interact with people, in the way that I share. I feel like if He's my Lord, I should do what He says. And if He says a new command, then I say, yes, sir. Uh, maybe the greatest commandment, go as you're going. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to do everything that I've commanded you. And then he tells us that he's with us forever. This one right here, this one that we do from page 7, I have it memorized differently in my mind, but it starts with just these few words, I want to know Christ, the way that I memorized it. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. And I oftentimes will ask my own self, do I want to know Him? Sometimes, believe it or not, there's people in church that are not fun to be around and certainly not fun to serve. I know that shocks you. And then I say, I want to know Him. I want to know Christ. And I realize that He came and served people that were difficult to serve. And He came and loved people who had their own strong, violent opinions. And sometimes in serving people who are difficult to serve, I feel like I get to know Him better. And so there's a few of those that I say, I just, I don't know if I can master the whole thing, but I certainly want to say, I want to master some of these that He's laid on my heart. And as I feel like, hey, I've got those, then I'll spread that out to more. But if I'm being honest... I've not gotten beyond those three as far as my ability to master them yet. So, start. Dive in. Pick out one of these DBRs that God lays on your heart, that God challenges you with. Let it change you. Master it. And then spread out to the next thing that He gives you to do. Commit yourself to a lifetime project of mastering the Bible and you'll find that it is mastering you and transforming your life by renewing your mind and heart. As we go through this today, there's going to be several points that I really like uh, that really talk about this. The, the very first thing that it's really hammering there on point B is that we're to commit ourselves, right? And it's laying that out. And it lays out why we should do that by sharing with us Psalm 37, 5, and then <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse 2. By the way, incredible. If you're following uh, kind of the teaching of this church right now, one of the things that we're really focusing on is worship this year. And one of the things that really changes the way that I see worship is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. In fact, if you were to go back into Romans chapter 11, verses 33, down through Romans chapter 12, verse 2, you would find, oh, seeing God for who He is and responding appropriately is, that's where I got that idea. It's from those passages. So why is a commitment to saturate your life with God's Word important? You'll notice that this isn't just a simple fill in the blank. This is asking you to process through what do you believe about that? What do you think? Not what did your first grade Sunday school teacher tell you or what did somebody tell you along the way? Not even what did I tell you, but what has God laid on your heart? Why is that important? Right? Let the Word of God teach you there. The next point there is C. Discipline yourself to do the following. 
right? And so it lays out several things, several ways that we can do this. Regularly hear the Word of God preached and taught. We're going to talk about that here in just a second, but that's one of the things that we can do. Why is that important? For me, it's important, not because I am the preacher, it's important for me to hear other preachers at times because I sometimes hear a different perspective. It's funny, I came from a farming background and so in my mind I think of myself as as plowing oftentimes. Well, when you plow, you stick one of your tires in a specific rut and you go and it helps you hold straight, it helps you keep stable, it helps maximize where the plow goes, all of those things. However, it does not require massive amounts of thought. Once the tractor has got its tire in that rut, you're good to go for a little while, right? Unless it's a short field, and then you're going to have to turn more often. But it could be set for a little while. Sometimes in my life, it's like that. In my Christian life, I get certain convictions, and my tire gets in a rut, and I pull. And I don't necessarily learn or think. And sometimes it takes somebody else's perspective to change or to challenge or to make me think a little bit differently. And so sometimes you'll find that your life gets in a rut. You're going along and you're living according to the convictions that God's given you, but you're not hearing other things from Him. And so sometimes it's good to hear a different perspective, a different thought. And so it's good to regularly hear the Word of God preached and taught. He goes on, invest time alone with God each day. It refers to this as a quiet time. I think it's just stopping and hearing. If we were in the military, we would wait for our orders each day. If we're faithfully working at a job, we're looking for direction from our boss each day. If we're submitted to anyone at all, we're waiting to hear what they would think. And if we are Christians, then we are submitted to the Lord and waiting to hear, God, what do you have for me today? That's important. So we go through this and we get really serious about this. And so on page 151 at the top, there's a reference, 1 Corinthians 4 or 9, 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. I'm going to read that real quickly for us, and uh, then we're going to go back and pick up some of the points that are in there. In a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets first prize. This room is actually full of people who like to get first prize. Y'all are, y'all are people who like to win. That's kind of fun. Well, most of you, some of you don't mind being late, but most of you like to win. That was for you, Phil. Just kidding. But look at what it says. He does, however, if you ever see this guy on a uh, kickball field, he will ruin a pair of khakis to win. <laughs> Won't you, brother? It's so amazing watching him, Mr. Laidback, go and start to compete. He wants to win. So run your race to win. To win the contest, you must deny yourself many things that would keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes to all this trouble just to win a blue ribbon or a silver cup. But we do it for a heavenly reward that never disappears. So I run straight to the goal with a purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. Like an athlete, I punish my body, treating it roughly, training it to do what it should, not what it wants to do. Otherwise, I fear that after enlisting others for the race, I myself might be declared unfit and ordered to stand aside. It's a powerful text, but sometimes we forget that we are running a race and that this race is intentional. It may be that our tire has been stuck in a rut a bit too long. That we've kind of been putting along and doing our own thing and forgotten that this is a battle. And it's a spiritual battle that has eternal consequences. And the way that I live matters. 
literally earlier as we were giving you all your moment to lead in small groups, Brandon and I were just reflecting on the small group leaders. We're reflecting on the influence. The people that are around you are here because you invited them. You've been running the race. Wow. Let's say the race were to be over right now. How awesome would it be that we have been running the race? That we're found doing what God has called us to do. And wouldn't it be awesome if we continue in that journey? That we run this race, that we do it. And so there's several things that I want you to see as we look at that. There's four points that I want you to write in the column to your left of, of that reference. Reference 1, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. There's four points. Here, I'll show you. Mine's, mine's over here. It's not going to be a whole lot of material. But number one is this. Set your goal to win. Set your goal to win. <clears throat> it's so fun. Several of you all I've played Settlers of Catan with. It's fun to do that, but it's not necessarily a very evangelistic game. You may lose a friend in that game. You may, especially in this room, there's people that don't mind to cut your throat just a little bit, right? You want to set your goal to win. What are we setting our goal for? What do we want to see happen for God's glory? Are we setting our goal to win? Number two, train seriously. Train seriously. There's so many illustrations that uh, I could come up with right here. But the one that sticks out this weekend, I get to go. I'm going to watch Rod compete in a competition. What's the name of that competition? Heroes of the Heartland. Heroes of the Heartland. So they're going to be... Com big yeah. <laughs> yeah. Going to be doing a CrossFit competition. But that's training seriously. I mean, they, they bring in nutritionists to tell them exactly what to eat and how to do it, how to discipline their life. They bring in certain um, workouts where they do it so their body is preparing and peaking at the right time. They are training seriously. It matters. Three, be determined. Be determined. Ah, oh, I wish I had another book that I'm taking a different group through. I, it's called The Barbarian Way, but it, the, the quote is that Christians who have been civilized are much too quickly to, quick to abdicate their lives or their convictions. Right? He's talking about being wild about our Lord and not willing to abdicate to silly things, to idolatry, right? Be determined. Be focused on what God has called you to do. Number four, practice discipline and self-denial. Now, right there, I could have gotten an amen from those first three points, I would think, but right here, everybody's like, I'm out, right? Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to practice discipline and self-denial. And so we find ourselves looking even more at Philippians 3.10. And we look at this where this verse, the way that I memorized it was, I want to know Christ. It's like a hearty amen. Yes to that. And the power of his resurrection. Yes again, sign me up. Then it says, and share in the fellowship of his sufferings. And I'm like, Anybody else want to, like, I'm at that point, if I'm in a tag team wrestling match, I'm like looking for my partner to tag out. Like, I want somebody else to do this part. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. But when it says the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, uh, you're in, right? I don't want to do that. But then I have to 
go on and it says becoming like him in death and it's like certainly no like now even if I couldn't find my tag team partner I'm going to search one out like I don't want that but here's what's happened in my heart I've come back to this phrase I want to know Christ and I've got to determine how much do I want to know Christ And then I see if sharing in the fellowship of his sufferings somehow helps me know him, then though I don't want to suffer, I'm willing to because it helps me know him. And the more I know him, the more I realize he's worthy. And the more I realize he's worthy, then I come to this place becoming like him in death. Like, I don't want that. I don't, everything in me, like the animal instincts in me is like, no, I want to survive. But then I realize if I die, he lives through me, through his resurrection. And I go back to, I want to know Christ. And so that phrase, I want to know Christ, becomes something that we want. Like, how valuable is that? Like, we look at this phrase, practice discipline and self-denial. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So why would I do that? Because I want something more. Because I want to do something more. I want to know Christ. So when we look at this, we need to set our goal to win. What is our goal? To know Him, right? So train seriously. Be determined. Practice self-discipline. These are four points that it's teaching us here from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. That as we look, it gives us a road map to say, how are you going to know Him? How are you going to do that? There's so many Christians in churches today that sit with their tractor tire in the rut. They're doing what they think they're supposed to be doing, but never are they setting a goal, training seriously, being determined, or practicing self-denial or discipline. Right? We're in a rut. And this is me, somebody who loves you enough to just say, this is the word of God, let's get out of the rut. Not that it's wrong to ever be set in that place where we know what we're to be doing, but also be listening to the word of God and letting it challenge us and change us and remold us and reshape us. You'll have a chance to read more about that in our study as we go through and then... It may be that uh, in this room, all the faces are a bit downtrodden. Maybe talking about this self-denial and discipline, everybody's like, oh, this is not fun, <laughs> right? Maybe you're hearing those things, and then you also hear Satan telling you, I don't think you can do it anyway. You failed. You've messed up. Right? This is me pointing him out, calling him out. And then point D, telling you this. Concentrate on just one day at a time. Don't hear the accusations for where you've blown it, where you've messed up. Don't hear the accusations for where you've failed in the past or where you've never been able to do it. I'm telling you today, concentrate on just one day at a time. And the reason I'm telling you that is not because I'm overly gracious, not because I'm a great teacher, but because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, this master teacher that we serve says this, give us this day our daily bread. What was he teaching us? Help me do today what I need to do. Give me the strength I have for today. Right? He knows what we need. When he taught us how to pray on an everyday basis, he knew what it was we needed. He knew what it was that we needed to focus on. You can't fix yesterday, but you can do today. 
Another reference that's there is Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But he said, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What is he saying? You gotta have the word of God every day. Here's the reality. I've been working on my diet and changing some of those things. Last night, we get home and we had a uh, soccer game that we had to go to at six o'clock. So that meant we didn't really have time to eat before the game. So that meant we were gonna eat at like 7.30. What that translates for in my mind is anger. Like I immediately knew I'm going to get hungry. I'm going to get cranky. I'm going to like all of a sudden, like what I've already eaten today is not really been cutting it. I'm already a little ticked off about it. And now I realize that now it's going to be 730 before I get to eat. And like I could already feel the tension rising, right? Just because I was going to go a couple extra hours before I got my meal. Here's what I want you all to get. How is it that we can go days without reading His Word? If it's our daily bread. If it's to sustain us every day. How is it that we could ever go a single day? Why, why aren't we reading it multiple times a day? Like Just to get a little bit of His Word. Just to get that sustenance. Why is it that... Whenever I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to put my devotion off for two hours that I don't feel myself getting a little bit tense there. It's never happened. I'm not, oh, oh, you know, I never find myself trying to yell at Michaela or anything. I didn't yell at her for this either, but by the way, I think I'm going to have to apologize for my prom comments. I think I may have uh, irreversibly wounded my daughter. And so uh, I'm going to have to be working that out this week. Uh, as we uh, are going through these ideas and we're looking at our, um, at our studies and we come to this summary page that really will help us uh, tie all of these things in. And it will remind us of point A, right, where it says ponder, picture, pray, or ponder and picture. And it was talking about that five points that we had from our hand last week. That was point A. And then we see commit. Commit to doing it. Discipline yourself to doing it and then concentrate on it each day at a time. I'm on page 153. The next thing that I want us to do is I want to uh, lead you to um, page 155. And on page 155, you'll find what is called the Daily Commitment Reminder. This one, I'm going to let us break up into groups again. And as we do, I want you all to rotate through this as you read it. Nobody has to get creative or anything like that, but it would be similar to somebody will say, since God has good plans for me today that give me a hope and a future. Then the next person would say, you don't have to read the reference with each one, but we all know that that's from the word of God. And just rotate through that. And I want you and your small groups to read through this page uh, but I want you to realize, because these things happen, it does something in me. So read those, and then I'll come back to you in a moment. When we talk about these concepts, it's pretty powerful. As we look at them, there's really this thought. It says since, but for me in my heart, it's because. Because we know this to be true. Because we know this to be right. Because we know this to be God's Word, then it changes us. In your own hearts, in your own minds, do you ever really reflect on what His Word is saying there? If I believe that, then how do I respond? So the next page is this, my daily commitment prayer. Since those things are because of those things, he says, Lord, I today commit myself to. And I'm just going to pray that as if I'm ponder picturing and praying this. Like as, and so I'm just inviting you all to come with me to the throne as I pray that. God, today I want to know you more deeply. 
and keep my eyes focused on you. Lord, today I commit myself to trust you with all my heart and not myself and to obey you and receive your blessing. Lord, today I commit myself to love you with all my heart, soul, and mind and to serve you with gladness. Lord, today I commit myself to yield to you and your control of my life. In fact, right now, I give you the full control of my life for the rest of today. Lord, today I commit myself to abide in you just as a fruitful branch must continue to abide in, being vitally united to the vine. Lord, today I commit myself to glorify you in every area of my life, including every thought, word, attitude, and action. Lord, today I commit myself to guard against the reasons for unfruitfulness, which we've learned are the cares, the burdens of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of or for other things. Lord, today I commit myself to reflect you and the fruit of your Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, today I commit myself to delight in you and your plan for my life. And Lord, help me to bring delight to you today. Lord, today I commit to make disciples as I go. Lord, you know that I cannot live out this commitment today in my own strength. Therefore, please live it out through me as I yield to your control. Amen. This faith of ours is teaching, but if it's only teaching, then it's never applied truth. We've got to take the things that God has taught us or given us and, and do something about it. Let it change us. And so that's the goal is meditating on truths like this really help us know God, help us know what he has in mind for us, what his thoughts are for us. I encourage you today to turn to pages 157 through 160. What you're going to find there is that it uh, gives us some ideas about sermon notes or lesson notes. As you're turning there, I'm going to read this story. There was a motivational speaker for corporations who shared about how sometimes he would not, or how we do not come prepared to take advantage of the opportunities we have. He told about visiting a church to hear a sermon. He said that he sat down and prepared to hear the message with a pen and paper in hand, ready to take notes on the message. He suddenly became aware that no one around him had a pen and paper. This thought crossed his mind. They must not be expecting much. We should attend a service expecting God to speak to us. When he speaks, we should be prepared to write down what he says. Once we write it down, then we can keep the notes until we have an opportunity to meditate on the truths. Then we meditate, or when we meditate, ponder, picture, pray the truths back to God as a personal prayer. We move these truths from our heads to our hearts, where they work their way out in application. I'll not forget uh, this last year, you all know that there was a lot of political things going on. And I'm not somebody who from a pulpit very often will promote my particular opinions because I never want to um, make somebody feel estranged based on politics. However, I do have some very strong convictions. So one of my friends who's sitting in this very room calls me one day and he says, John, a certain candidate is coming through town. Would you mind to take a role in leadership as they come through? So obviously I was excited and yes, what do you need to do? What do you need me to do? So I want you to, and he lays out a list of things that need to happen. Times that I need to be there, people that I need to talk with, 
things that I need to understand that uh, are going on, things that I, he wants me to be sensitive to, lays out this thing. Well, guess what? Uh, suddenly it became more than I felt comfortable with remembering. And I thought, ooh, what do I do? I don't want to blow it. I don't want to mess up an opportunity. I don't want to mess up a chance to share God's grace. So what did I do? I wrote down the things that were being communicated. The time, where it was going to be, what was going to be happening, what I needed to be sensitive about, what I needed to be encouraging about. All of these things, who I needed to meet, I wrote those things down. Why? Because it mattered. Well, guess what? This guy is not near as important as God. Period. The candidate that I was preparing to pray for and about is not near as important as God. So when we talk about sermon notes, you could look at that, and I feel a little awkward because I am the preacher hearing, like saying, it's not about me. It's not about what the pastor is doing or whether or not he was dynamic or talented or good or crafty. It's not about that. It's about coming and hearing what is God saying to me? What is the one who created me telling me to do today? Where is he challenging me? Now, y'all can personify that and make that about the person who's standing up there, but the reality is that's not what it's about. It's about God speaking directly into your life. God, whose spirit already knows exactly what's happening in your soul, challenging you towards a walk with Him. So, when we talk about sermon notes, that's what it's talking about, and that's what it's challenging us to do. Write down who the speaker is, the date, the location, the text, the title, those kind of things. What are some of the outline or main points? What are the scripture references? Maybe some quotes or illustrations that make a big deal to you. But what I'm particularly asking you to do is write down what is God telling you? What is He saying to you through this? Right? Now, when you do that, you can go home and you can 3P the promise or the truth that God has laid on your heart. You can go home and say, okay, God... I want you to apply that. And you can take that from your head to your heart. When we hear the Word of God preached, make notes and meditate on what God says, it helps us know Him better. Okay, so today we're ready to move on into our next section. And that is this. It's time to write our verse on the card. Now you all will be happy to see this one. There's several reasons why you're going to be happy to see this particular verse. It's on the front of the card, you need to write 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7. Underneath that, on that front of the card, you can write the word comfort. Yes! Who doesn't want comfort, right? We all want comfort. We all need comfort. We all like comfort, right? So this verse is one that will give us comfort. So 1 Peter 5, 7 is what we write on the front of the card. Right underneath that, you can write the word comfort. Then below that, or on the back of the card, which is the second reason why you're going to really like this verse, not only is it about comfort, but it's also very short. So you're going to like that. So you all will be able to um, write that and memorize that relatively quickly. So here's what that will do for you. I really genuinely believe that you all could get this one memorized by the end of today. That's me throwing out a gauntlet. I think you can do it. So then second thing is this, why would I want you to get it done today? I want you to meditate on this the remainder of the day or the remainder of the week. I want you to have this. Here's the deal. There's a lot of Christians who have read this verse. A lot of Christians who know it. There are very few Christians who trust it and live it out. I want us to be the people who trust it and live it out. I'll give you a little bit of time to write that down.
There's an old leadership axiom. It says people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. It's interesting. I think that it's true in everyday life. If people didn't feel like I cared about them, they wouldn't care what I say from the pulpit. If they didn't know that I care what's going on in their life or care what's happening in their heart or care about who they are with their walk, you know, they wouldn't care what I have to say. Now you take that idea and you multiply it by a thousand, by infinity. And it says, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Why can I trust Him? Why can I believe that He's got me taken care of? Why do I give Him my life? This right here, it's a pen. Going back to the tractor illustration, these big old huge implements that tie on to the back of a tractor that make that tractor effective. Its, it's engine is awesome, but if it doesn't have some sort of an implement behind it, what's it really doing, right? So you have to have something that latches that tractor to the implement. Well, genuinely, it's something pretty simple. I always called it a pin, but it's just a linchpin. It, it, it fits in to this little hole and holds everything together. This verse becomes a linchpin for me. Suddenly I'm like, okay God, you call me to sacrifice, to give, to respond. Why? Because He cares for me. You probably have heard me say this. Jesus cares more about you than you do. Jesus loved you more in three hours on a cross than you could serving yourself the rest of your life. So cast all your cares on Him. Cast all your anxieties on Him. He cares for you. Remember that as we meditate on these things, memorizing and meditating, it helps us know Him. And then I want to direct your attention to page 161. On page 161, you'll find uh, your assignment page. That'll help you have your roadmap as you go through the remainder of this week, as you work through the details of this week. It should be uh, relatively self-explanatory for you at this point as you work through it. Um, I think as we do, um, that leads us to the place where we can pray for one another. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you in your small groups get together. Just share what prayers you may need for one another. It's 7.30, so don't... Actually, I'm going to just say the prayer and then get you all out of here, okay? Let's pray.